working man in this country, the Vice President of the United States. Now, I have to tell you the truth. The, I liked uh, what the Congresswoman said about the Vice President. <coughs> Uh, I knew that he had a great record. Uh, I knew that he had a tremendous positive impact on this nation. But I never really noticed that he has a really great smile. And if you look at him, he does have a nice smile, doesn't he? Let's give a big round of applause for the Vice President. Great smile. My friends, pay family leave. It's been an, an important issue for a long time. Uh, but it is an issue whose time has come. Because things happen when the planets line up and the political will and the body politic develops. And the body politic says enough is enough. Now is the time to pass paid family leave. Now, are angry out there. Working men and women are angry. More than angry, they're frustrated, they're scared, they feel that they've been abandoned, they feel that they're on their own, and it's with good cause. They're working harder than ever before, and they're not getting ahead. In fact, they are going backwards. The rich are getting richer, and the working men and women of this country are going backwards. That's not a cliche. That is a fact. And it's not just about the money. It's about more than the dollars and cents. It's about who they are in today's society. It is about respect, and it is about values. Today, Today we have a rampant economic injustice that not only devalues the work, but actually degrades the work. And that's not the way it was supposed to be. That's not the promise that made America, America. 80 years ago, FDR signed the Social Security Act because he wanted to protect people from the vagaries of the marketplace. FDR's promise was premised on the philosophy of America, which said, you know what, we are interconnected and we are interrelated. And we are there one for the other. And we believe in each other. And we respect one another. And we value one another. And we respect the dignity of work. That's what FDR's vision was all about. And that's the vision that made this country great. We are losing that vision. We are losing that philosophy. Social Security has now transformed into an era of social insecurity, where the worker feels they're out of control, and the economy is being changed and controlled by forces that are not fair and are not just, and they are right. And the economic injustice is pervasive. You can see it throughout the marketplace. You can see it in how a company divides its, its profits. 50 years ago, a CEO made 20 times what the working men and women made. Today, the CEO makes 300 times what the working man and woman makes. You can see it in the devaluation of wages. People don't even get paid what they're worth anymore. That's what the fight about minimum wage is all about. That's why New York is saying we want $15 as a minimum wage. Because a minimum wage is supposed to be a livable wage. And you can't live unless there's $15 an hour. That was the point of the minimum wage. Now the opposition says in our proposal of the $15 that's too high. I don't think it's too high. Let them try to live on the minimum wage and then tell me $15 is too high. And when they say that, know this. If you had taken the minimum wage in 1970 and just indexed it to the rate of inflation, you know what it would be today? 
our proposal for $15. It's fair, it's right, it's just. We have to pass it this year. And too many workers are disrespected and taken for granted and treated as a commodity. And the Congresswoman's story is exactly right. There are too many workers who, if they go to their employer and they say, you know what, I need a few weeks off to take care of a family member, that employer will say, oh, you can take a few weeks off. And as a matter of fact, don't bother coming back. Workers have a sense that they're just replaceable commodities. And if you don't have this one, you'll go out and you'll find another one. And their respect and their bargaining power and their power in the relationship has been depleted. And that's what we have to change, especially when it comes to this issue on paid family leave. There are times in life when you should be with family members. Because that's what it's all about at the end of the day. It's really not about work. It's about those personal relationships. When you have a newborn baby, you should be there. And you should enjoy it. And you should feel it. And the baby should have the benefit of you. Christy's exactly right. If you have a family member who's sick, you should be there. And you should be able to be there. If you have a family member who's passing away, God forbid, you should be there. I know the feeling. I went through it last year with my father. We knew he had weeks, he had months at most. That was the time to be there. That is a precious, precious time. That is a time you need to say things that need to be said. That is a time you need to be there just to hold a hand, just to dry a tear. You need to be there. And you should have that option in life. And you shouldn't have to choose between losing your job and being in debt or being a decent human being in life. That's why we are proposing 12 weeks of paid family leave, the most aggressive standard in the nation. a disgrace that this nation is one of three on the planet that doesn't have paid family leave. The other two are Suriname and Papua New Guinea. The United States should not be one of the three and that has to change and New York is going to lead the way in making that change happen. struggle is bigger than any one issue because this is really about rebalancing the economic relationship and was re restoring the workers rights and dignity in society that's why we stand up and we support prevailing wage for our brothers and sisters in the labor movement justice is once again the law of the land. And we're going to do it here in New York because we are the progressive capital. The nation does look to us to lead. We raise the flag. We raise the banner. We say the way is forward. The way is up. Follow us. We did it on marriage and equality. We did it on gun control. We did it on women's equality. of a man who's been fighting this battle and many, many other battles on behalf of the working families of this country for many, many years. And not just fighting the battles, but winning the battles. 
And that man is the Vice President of the United States of America. It's easy to smile when you're in New York. It's easy to smile when you show up in a place where you agree with everyone in the audience and you agree with everyone on the stage. That doesn't happen all the time. That doesn't happen all the time. And to all my colleagues in the Congress, all members of the legislature, and, uh, and to leaders of labor, uh, as you know, labor, I am, uh, as my uncle would say, uh, labor from belt buckle to shoe sole. You guys are the reason why we had any, by the way, let's get something straight here for all kidding aside. The reason why we have had any worker protection since the late 1800s to today, the reason why is because of organized labor, unions. Yeah. Christy, it's, it's great to be with you, and Senator, you as well, because you two have been fighting the fight, and you've never slowed up, and Carol has been my buddy for a long, long time. Matter of fact, we were together yesterday down in, as my father would say, he was born in Baltimore. They don't say Baltimore, they say Baltimore. We are down in Baltimore for a, a get-together for the Democratic uh, Congressional uh, Caucus. Uh, and, uh, and Governor, uh, it's always great to be with you, but I always feel like I'm with you that when I finish, speak after you, I'm being redundant. Uh, I think I should just say, amen. I agree. <laughs> i tell you what, I mean this sincerely, and a lot of the press knows I mean this, that uh, if I only get to pick one man or one woman that I gotta stand with and take it on a opposition that is real, or fighting for a cause that starts in my heart, this is the guy I want with me. This is the guy. So, uh, the thing, uh, thing I love about the governor is the same thing I loved about his dad. I said something that uh, I probably shouldn't have said, but it's on the record, I'll repeat it. It's, uh, um, I have been in public life for a long time now, since I was a 29-year-old kid, Charlie. And uh, the only man or woman I've ever met that I just looked at and said, that person's better than I am at what they do, was your dad. And I really mean that. Your dad, your dad like you, was an intellectual force, but also a moral force. He was a moral force. And he shamed the nation into doing some things we should have done a long time ago. But Governor, uh, you have picked up the mantle and you have exceeded, uh, I think, uh, probably even your dad's expectations. Because what you've done here, you really have, you really have led. You really have led. And uh, from minimum wage to marriage equality to uh, all the things that, you've, that you and your colleagues have stepped out front and done. And you know, uh, as the President and I talk about it, uh, much of what we care most about the last seven years has uh, been led by the states, led by localities, led by the governors. And you've been the leader among them. I was here in September when the governor talked about the efforts to raise the minimum wage for fast food workers across the state. It was about trying to give workers a good wage, uh, about giving people a shot at the middle class. Now I know I'm always referred to as middle class Joe. And in Washington, as Carolyn can tell you, that's not been as a compliment. It means I must not be sophisticated if you're middle class. You think I'm joking, I'm not. You all know the deal, you know. But the truth of the matter is, the reason why I talk about the middle class so much is the middle class is the reason for the social and political stability of this country. As long as, long as I, I would say this for an applause line, I say this, this is a fact in my view. Matter of fact, I just spoke to 2,000 world leaders in Davos, uh, Switzerland, and made uh, the, the same case as their keynote speaker. The reason why America has maintained the social and political stability it has 
over the last 120 years has been this notion of expectations. I was with President Xi, who I spent a lot of time with, more than anybody else, by a quirk of fate. And I spent 25 hours of private dinners with him. I was in Chengdu, China. And he turned to me for real and he said, can you define for me what it is, what America is? And I said, I can do that in one word. And I mean it sincerely. One word. Possibilities. What America is about is possibilities. And as long as people believe, I really mean it, distinguished from every other nation in the world, distinguished from every other nation in the world, what brings people here? Why do people feel so good around the rest of the world about who we are? Because we have advertised the notion that anything is possible here. But as the governor said, for the first time in a long time, an awful lot of Americans are feeling that the deck is stacked, that the likelihood of the possibilities they have, they dream of for them and their children, are not within their reach. You know, governor's heard me say it many times, my dad, God love him, was a, well, was a gentle man, a graceful man, a high school educated guy who made a decent living for his family and his four children. And he used to say he lost his job, but he left Scranton, Pennsylvania because there was no work in the early 50s. I was in third grade. And I remember him moving to Wilmington, Delaware. And he moved down and said, Joey, there's good jobs down there. I'll come back. You live with your grandma and grandpa, and uh, I'll, 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 I'll be back. I'll come home every weekend. It's only 157 miles, but it's going to be okay. And I'll be able to bring you all down. From that moment on in my dad's life, my children, my siblings, heard my father say, if you heard him say it once, I heard him say it a thousand times, and then he would lose a job. He said, Joey, a job is about a lot more than a paycheck. A job is about your dignity. It's about your place in society. It's about who you are. And when we talk about the middle class, it's not a number in America. It's a value set. It's not about a particular income. It's about being able to care for your family. It's about being able to, I mean, I mean this is a about being able to look them in the eye and say, honey, it's gonna be, it's gonna be okay. It's that simple, it's that basic. And what happens is, what happens is today, it's only come down to a quality of life. And what you all are fighting for here, what we are celebrating today, for example, we're celebrating today the fact that uh, we, the Lily Ledbetter law was passed. What was that all about? That's all about just quality of life. It's about women being able to get paid the same amount of money men get paid for the, for the same work. It's about... It's about It is a middle class value. It's about saying that I'm entitled as a woman to know what everybody else in this outfit is being paid so I know whether or not I'm being taken advantage of. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's, about, uh, it's about a whole lot of things. People in, uh, in, uh, in your state, Governor, uh, know what you're fighting for, and this is an issue they understand at their core. The thing that always bugs me is when I talk to businessmen and women and they're unwilling to support an initiative that will increase the quality of life even though it will not cost them anything as a practical matter. It's one thing to go out and say, I expect the business to do all these things for me and I not contribute to it. That's not what you're talking about. What you're talking about here is saying to businesses, exactly what we said years ago re with regard to unemployment insurance. We decided that you all pay into a fund so that if you get laid off, your quality of life will not completely evaporate and you have a fighting chance to take care of your family. It's the same thing with Social Security. Social Security wasn't a gift. Everybody pays into the deal. It's about, it's about helping, it's about helping everybody. Well, here we go, today, we're talking about an element, another element that helps workers be able to stay in the middle class life. It involves worker protections. Lack of worker protections means being able to uh, not being able to stay in the middle class. There, you know, there, there has to be there have to be protections. 
that are fair and decent. And, uh, and, you've, and you've done that, Governor. It's straightforward and simple. California has done this, Rhode Island has done this, New Jersey has done this. But this is gone, this is going beyond where they are. People in New York State would be able to have 12 weeks of paid family leave, so that that's up to three months now. So they can take care of a, of a recovering or, God forbid, a dying son, daughter, or mother. And look, folks, uh, everyone who spoke before me said it well. Um, how, how do you, and some of you had to make the choice, how do you choose between leaving the bedside of your dying son or daughter who doesn't want you to leave, just wants to hang on to go to work? Because you don't go to work, you don't go to work, you don't go to work for a while, you may not be able to turn the lights on in that apartment or that house where that child is. You may not be in a situation where you can provide the basic necessities for the rest of your kids and or, uh, and or your family, extended family. And look, um, as they say in the Senate, excuse, excuse the point of personal privilege, I think the single most devastating thing for a parent or a son or daughter taking care of a parent is to look at that person in need and know there's not a damn thing you can do to help them. Know that, and especially if the one help they want is just the solace of you holding their hand. Tell them a story about you remember when they were a kid. Just, just reminiscing with them. Just giving them the solace being able to deal with bravely what they're facing. It's just simply the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And you know what? I believe the vast majority of Americans know that. I believe the vast majority of employers know that. I believe the vast majority of humanity understands that it's not worth much at all. If you can't be there, when the persons you love the most need you the most, physically or emotionally. So here's the deal. You know, uh, um, if you take a look at what the governor's proposing here, from women's rights to equal pay, from moving on the front of uh, minimum wage to dealing with uh, um, paid leave, um, it is all about uh, who we are as a society. And this is real basic stuff, man. This isn't complicated. This is really basic, basic stuff. What kind of people are we? What do we really value? <laughs> and you know, uh, that's what the president and I have been trying to do. The Affordable Care Act, providing millions of working families access to all the work. But you know what it does, folks? I keep telling the president, it's not the 19 million people not have insurance. It's about what some of you've gone through. Going to bed at night and staring at the ceiling. And knowing if that beautiful, lovely woman next to you, your wife, gets breast cancer and is an extremist, you may lose your house. No one. Knowing that if you get sick, everything may be gone. That's the thing I think the Affordable Care Act is more than anything else. It provides peace of mind for millions and millions of people. We cut taxes for working class families and made permit the expansion of tax credits for low wage workers and their families and their children. These people are busting their neck. They're busting their neck. So millions of families that are edge can, can, can do more with the harder pay they have. We've announced changes which most people who, who've never worked really that hard in their life don't understand. All the rules relating to what constitutes management versus labor and overtime pay. Well, we went in and decided since we couldn't get anything done in the Congress, a 
president by executive order said, look, we're changing what constitutes overtime pay and who's qualified. The end result is, it means five million more workers just by that executive order are getting paid sometimes 10, 20, 30 percent more than their paycheck now because they've worked those hours. It means 300,000 people here in New York State alone are in a very different financial circumstance. This is the difference between making sure you can make the car payment and pay the electric bill and still be okay. These are little things most people think, but they're gigantic in terms of people's quality of life. Think about how many people are so vulnerable. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, but in my neighborhood, Charlie, I, when we first got in office, and the president let me set up the middle class task force. And I was allowed to call, I had 19 cabinet meetings I called. And I told the first meeting, every cabinet member, oh, this is the truth, I wanted to hire one person who worked directly for them, I wanted the name of that person, and their job, only job every day when they get up is what can we do administratively to help bring relief to middle class families. And so the first outfit to come with an idea for us was the Treasury Department. They said, you know, we can we can really make a difference in these 529s. You know, this the money you could put away for college tuition. Well, you know, I went through this and I have a middle class staff that works for me. They're raised in neighborhoods like I was raised in. And they all said, that's a great idea. And I looked around, Governor, and I said, I don't know anybody who has one of those. I'm not joking. I don't know anybody who has one of those. Because people, all the people I grew up with, working like hell, they don't have any money to put aside after they pay everything. They're not in that position, an awful lot of American workers. So it's a great idea, and I made a bet with these folks. I said, what percentage of the people with college age kids or kids would be going to college do you think have one of these? And they went, went from 50% to 25, I said, I tell you what, I may be listed as the poorest man in Congress, which I was, unfortunately. And I and the Washington Post, when I filed my financial disclosure, said it's probable no man has ever assumed the office of vice president with fewer assets than Joe Biden. I assumed they were talking financial, not intellectual assets. I said, if any more than 10% of the people in America have these, these, these little funds, I said, I'll buy you all lunch once a month in any restaurant you pick. Well, guess what? Only 7% of Americans have it. We gotta understand what the middle class faces, man. We gotta understand what is really, what life is really like, even when they're living in a decent house, in a decent neighborhood. So how many people do you know who could possibly go three months without a paycheck, without fundamentally altering, fundamentally altering their life? Now, those of us in this business, we know a lot of wealthy people. They go along, take out a lot of savings. But the neighborhood I'm from, which is a middle class neighborhood, I don't know anybody who can go three months without a paycheck, without fundamentally changing the way they are. So look, at its core, what you all are fighting for is just simple, simple opportunity and affording people dignity to practice the values we say we care about. That's what we're doing here today. Making sure that hardworking people have an opportunity to provide the quality of life for their families and loved ones that their hard work should have already entitled them to. We've called on the Congress to raise the federal minimum wage. The president signed an executive order raising minimum wage for federal workers and under with that contracts with us. We have a tax proposal that the latest budget that would triple child care tax credit for middle class families help would cover child care for 6.7 million children. I love it when I hear, Christy, that, you know, a lot of these working women aren't so financially bright. Well, let me tell you, they're pretty damn bright. If it costs you $18,000 a year for child care that's adequate, and you're going to get paid $24,000 a year, it's a very wise political decision not to work. So my point is that these guys, they don't understand. They don't understand the problems of ordinary people. But to help working families, we need to help them take the time off when they need it without having to choose, as we've said many times, between caring for a family and losing a paycheck. A year ago, the president dedicated uh, 
decided that the federal government should uh, should step up uh, to six weeks of, of paid sick leave uh, for events like birth, adoption, child uh, 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 adoption of a child. We called on Congress to give the federal workers six additional weeks of paid parental leave. Last September, the president signed an executive order requiring federal contractors to offer paid sick leave to employees. 300,000 people working on federal contracts now have the ability to earn. It's only seven days. You're talking uh, three months ago, but it's a start. It's an issue that's close to my heart. That executive order that also enables federal contractors to use paid sick leave for absence resulting from domestic violence. I could go on and on and I've been standing too long. We have a rule in my home state of Delaware to keep an audience standing more than 15 minutes and lose them all. You've been standing a lot more than that. Let me conclude by saying to you all that, uh, you know, uh, um, there's a way without breaking the bank we can help, uh, help middle class families. Uh, there's a way we can make a significant dent in the gender gap. There's a way. Uh, that uh, we can do all of these things that are totally within our wheelhouse and totally consistent with American values that aren't radical at all. Just a continuation of what used to be part of this social contract we had. And the middle class is getting clobbered. For the first time in the last hundred years, the United States does not have the wealthiest middle class in the world. Only 49% of the American people qualify to be in the middle class based on the numbers that we use. That's got to change, folks. That's got to change. And we don't have to be a progressive like those of on the stand to understand it. You have everyone from Standard & Poor's to the IMF saying the greatest threat to economic expansion is the continued concentration of wealth. The greatest threat to economic, there's not a liberal think tank. This is Standard & Poor's, the IMF, and the World Bank, the studies show. Because you may make widgets that people buy, but if people don't have enough money to buy your widgets, you're ultimately in real trouble. Folks, this is in everybody's interest, including the employer. Let's get it done.